many people in, in Western music, there's often a billion different ways to go with what you're doing. Um, obviously, different traditions from different parts of the world, you go and study with different teachers, they point you in one direction, go and study with another teacher, it goes the other direction. Uh, you find, especially uh, with those uh, sorts of music, if you're looking at Afghan music or uh, Persian music or Turkish music or Armenian music, um, it's very, I guess it's more single direction. It was such a pleasure to get a chance to sit down and chat with Elson Price for the podcast. Elson is based in Sydney, Australia, and he is a world music bassist in the truest sense of the word. As you'll find out as we dig into this episode, he's doing so many different projects with so many different artists and a lot of solo projects, and it's just really exciting to see what he's up to. We're going to feature a bunch of tracks from Elson from his recent album, Chicken Chili Basil, which is a fantastic (laughs) name for an album. And we have links to more information about Elson, his Facebook page, and all that kind of good stuff in the show notes. We also are sponsored today by Upton Bass. Thank you, Upton, for sponsoring and A440 Violin Shop, as well as Bass Violin Shop. So thank you, A440 Bass Violin Shop and Upton for sponsoring this episode. Really appreciate it. And let's dig into this conversation with Elson Price. It, you know, like if you run into someone in an elevator and they ask, what do you do? Like, what, what would you tell them? Uh, my work practice is working with world music. So working with mus- uh, musicians based in a specific ethnic uh, musical background. At the moment, I'm working with uh, Kurdish musicians, Turkish musicians, Armenian musicians, uh, Persian musicians, and a few other types of things, like a bit of personal study in, in different areas. Um, I collaborate regularly with living composers, uh, more specifically um, Australian composers like uh, Keena Wilkins, Andrew Batrout, and uh, David Hush, um, plus, I guess, a few different other people over the shop. And I also do a solo improvised performance where I incorporate both those areas into improvising. Tell us about where, where you grew up, how you got into music, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I'm from Tamworth. Uh, it's, it's noted as the, the country music capital of Australia, um, which means that it has, a, it has a music festival that happens for two weeks of the year. The rest of the year, there's absolutely nothing that goes on. But um, that, was, that had a fairly significant impact because um, I, I grew up listening to really good uh, fiddle players. Um, and I, I started out on violin when I was, I was very young um, and then sort of jumped on the bass and played in the local orchestra till I guess I was about 18. Uh, then I thought I'd have a crack at uh, professional music, so I did my first audition. I got into the New South Wales Police Band. Um, did that for two years. Um, that was that was an interesting learning curve. Um, it's an interesting work work environment because um, you know there's people that have been there for five years up to thirty years and have have various um, I guess perspectives on performance. Um, after doing that for two years, I decided I wanted to properly study. So I, I got into the Sydney Con and I studied under Alex Henry, uh, the principal of the Sydney Sim. Um, yeah, I was there for four years. Halfway through, I started getting more interested in doing my own thing, uh, sort of putting on my own ensembles, collaborating with different kinds of musicians. There was a few different experimental ensembles called the Noise Ensembles that I put together, where I initially got five different people from different backgrounds and put them all together and said, let's all write a piece each. And there's no limits on any of this sort of stuff. And we workshop it for two or three months. And then we perform it once, we record the performance, and that's it type thing. So it was a, so it was a big sort of a learning thing for everybody. Um, that was a bit of fun. Uh, then when I finished, um, yeah, I just, I've just been working with, um, I guess, lots of different people. Um, but mainly specifically heading in those, in those three different areas. So in, uh, as an improvising soloist, uh, working with... Um, I guess, well musicians than working with living composers. So, yeah.
And I think I read somewhere that you were doing an apprenticeship as a mechanic. Is that right? Uh, before yeah, music that, school? That, yeah. That, that, that sort of happened in the midst between high school and, and being, it, was, it was very interesting because um, I hadn't really thought about professional music before that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd sort of gone and done that and evidently after doing that for three months, it was sort of a, a no-go. Okay. It just wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't the right fit. It was actually the guy running the shop that said, you're, you're not a mechanic. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, so when, um, actually the day I, I got out of there, I, I got a call for a, a, a full-time covers band. So I sort of jumped into that for a few months before um, auditioning for the job. Let's take a break to thank our wonderful sponsors for this episode, Upton Bass, A440, and the Bass Violin Shop. And I'd like to play you this clip from David White, who is a theater musician based in New York City, and his experience with his Upton Bass. It's a great story. I have to mention Upton Bass in Connecticut because those guys have really bailed me out, and Eric specifically has become a good friend. He's a very, very nice guy. The story of my upright is my grandmother, who I was very close with, passed away before my senior year of high school. And she was always a very big supporter of me playing. And uh, she always came to every concert, was the loudest cheerleader. Anyway, when she passed away, she was kind enough to leave money for me to be able to purchase a professional instrument. And for a long time, I had been looking around, trying to find some stuff. And I said, you know, I, I really like these vintage instruments, but, you know, I didn't want to spend... 30, 40 grand on something that I just kind of liked. So just kind of searching, I stumbled upon Upton and I said, you know what, I think I want to get a new instrument built, something to my specifications. And it was also very an, an, an intensely personal process for me because of, because of the history with my grandmother. Anyway, I went to them and they bent over backwards to make this beautiful 7 8 space. And I had gotten it and I was playing a tour of Guys and Dolls and I set it on a chair and my foot got caught in a cable and down she went and I cracked mm-hmm. off the entire scroll. Now, the funny thing was I happened to be in New London, Connecticut, which is about six miles down the road from their shop. So uh, Dave, who runs their website, ran over, gave me a rental base, took my, my damage base, went away with it and uh, fixed it up. Learn more about them at UptonBase.com. And thank you also to A440, my longtime shop that I would go to in Chicago, Illinois. It's just west of Wrigley Field. They specialize in sales, repairs, restoration, all sorts of stuff. If you're looking for an instrument and you're in the Midwest or a bow or a place to get great work done on your instrument, check out A440. Great place to go, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast, guys. Also, BassViolinShop.com is the place to go if you are in the southeastern United States and looking for a bass. And Mark Ridge says of the Bass Violin Shop, he says, The Bass Violin Shop is definitely the place to go for all your bass needs. Bob and his staff are very professional, knowledgeable, and helpful. Thank you, Bob, for helping us out of our dilemma. I like doing business with a man that will take the time to talk to me and help me out. Sometimes things are not always cut and dried, and Bob went out of his way to be helpful and meet our needs. When it comes time to buy our bass, we will be back to the Bass Violin Shop. Great endorsement. You can read many more at their website, BassViolinShop.com. All right, back to our conversation with Elson Price. I saw the name Harry Parch pop out. Uh, are you a Harry Parch fan? I'm a, I'm a, yeah, pretty big Harry Parch fan. When, when did you discover? I'm, I love Harry Parch. I became totally fascinated with him uh, back, you know, early 20s and living out here in California now. It's kind of cool to, you know, see a couple remnants of that sort of crazy time period still out here. Like, when, when did you discover him? Do you remember? Um, probably about three or four years ago. Um, and the one thing that really stuck out to me with Harry's music um, was the connection between, I guess, new composition and, I guess, ethnic music. Um, when you think about music that's outside of traditional 12-tone music. Um, and he'd, I guess, he'd sort of um, worked it out in that, in that respect, sort of taking a step backwards and, you know, incorporating some ancient scales and ancient rhythms and, and that sort of perspective into the, the world music. Because, I mean, if you spend time around, I've just come up a, a wonderful tour with uh, Sharon Nazari, a wonderful Iranian singer. Um, if you spend time around people who work in a different, 
uh, I guess, uh, musical world outside of Western. Like they think about things a little bit differently. And um, I think Ari offers a, a wonderful connection between those two different areas. Um, thinking outside of Western also obviously being able to interpret something from a Western perspective. It's, um, yeah, it's clever stuff. <laughs> It was sort of eye-opening when you started working with all these world musicians, people from different parts of the world. Like, how do they, you mentioned, like, thinking about music differently. Like, how do they think about music maybe differently than us conservatory-trained folks do? Um, one thing that really sticks out is, I mean, for many people in, in Western music, there's often a billion different ways to go with what you're doing. Um, obviously, different traditions from different parts of the world, you go and study with different teachers, they point you in one direction, go and study with another teacher, it goes the other direction. Uh, you find, especially uh, with those uh, sorts of music, if you're looking at Afghan music or uh, Persian music or Turkish music or Armenian music, um, it's very, I guess it's more single direction. Like there's, there's, it's very specific about the people who know how to do it and you obviously study with them to learn how to do that. So they... They tend to be very focused in the direction that they learn. Um, I think that's, I found that's a very big contrast between Western study and I guess a, um, a traditional, um, world music study is that we have so much variation, um, with what we do, especially in the West where it's becoming more and more common to be departing from classical and going to improvising and especially with new music. Um, you're asked to do lots and lots of different things and, and think outside the box sort of constantly. Um, and that, that's something that I found very interesting because, I mean, if they, they know what they're after, they tend to chase it uh, a lot quicker. Um, they tend to be, they tend to know what they're doing, you know, pretty convincingly. What's the role of the bass, maybe traditionally, in some of those uh, the, the types of music? Um, in Persian music, um, there's no, I don't think there's any strong, uh, I guess, bass voice. They do have a bass comanche. A comanche is their, their string instrument. Um, they do have a bass comanche, and there's a wonderful Persian bass player. His name's Mespa, I can't pronounce his last name, Mespa, M-E-S-B-A-H, who... Um, does some absolutely terrifying um, bass commando playing. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. I'll, I'll try and send his last name at some point. Um, um, but the, I mean, traditionally, it's it's voice, commando, tar, um, possibly oud, and plus uh, a lot of percussion. So that's the the natural, I guess, way it's, it's performed. If you check out different links, and that's I guess the traditional lineup. The bass sits well because they. They do use uh, non-12 tone scales. Um, there's a scale called Sher, which is uh, essentially a minor scale with a slightly flat two. Um, if you spend enough time sort of practicing and listening to that sort of thing, you can sort of do it. Um, there's also uh, Esfahan, which is uh, another type of minor scale with a slightly raised six, and it just sort of goes on and on. Um, I've found with the bass, you can, you can, I mean, you can play the scale. It's a, it's a fretless instrument, so you can play the scale, but you can also I guess, be influenced by the Comanche. The way they play Comanche is a little different to uh, the violin. It's a, I guess it's a slightly more breathy sound, um, but still very, quite virtuosic. They tend to play everything in first position. Um, like in, if related to a violin, it's, it's all sort of very much under the hand. So it's very fast, very virtuosic playing. Um, but with this very breathy sound. So, you know, if you, if you jump on the bass, you can sort of let you, your bow hair down and sort of put each of rosin on and sort of try and emulate it in that respect. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting concepts within the music. How did the 
you develop that palette, do you have some influences, maybe on the bass or outside of the bass, that contributed to that cool language you've created for yourself? Um, when I got interested in the solo playing, um, it was halfway through my degree, and I was I was sort of thinking, oh, you know, I should. I, I'm really interested in solo playing, but like, what do I do? I mean, I'm in Sydney. I, I love music scene, sort of pretty low at the moment. And I think booking yourself for a solo bass gig sort of the last, <laughs> the last thing and anyone's sort of wanting to hear. So I literally went across the road um, to my local cafe and said, can I play here on a Sunday morning? And the guy there was like, I've been buying coffee off the guy for three years. So he's like, yeah, sure. Cool. I can pay you back for all your lovely attendance. And, um, yeah, I, I've always improvised. I've always been improv uh, interested in improvising. So I sort of got there in the morning and decided I'd just sit there for as long as I can and just come up with different ideas. I did loop pedal. That's um, a bit easier, especially for the, the bass, because you it's um, it's hard work, um, I guess, being caught on the instrument for longer than you know um, an hour or so. Uh, these performances went for about four or five hours. Um, the, the barista was kind enough to come bring me a copy every, every hour, which is... Which is nice, but um, during these sessions, I guess I was able to explore the instrument, um, not necessarily in a like a in an insular way, just sort of please my own thing, but sort of looking around and making sure that I'm entertaining people. And things like the the variety of tonal palettes, so the the punted cello and the pits and um, some you know it's sliding, uh, tapping, harmonics, all that sort of thing really grabs people. Um, I mean, in in uh, I guess in uh, comparison, like a, a violinist or a, a clarinet player, they can move around and there's some sort of visual component. You can't really move much with the double bass, um, which because um, after, after that I went and started doing street performing, and that's when it starts to get really tricky because, um, I mean, people aren't really interested in seeing someone who doesn't move. So you have to just be very creative with, with what you're doing. And I guess I came up with a bit of a formula. Um, for, for improvising, you know, just keeping it interesting, keeping it a little bit odd, just so people at least engage, and then you know, hopefully, there's some good music at the end of it. And you're you compose, so you, obviously you improvise, but you compose yourself as well. Yes, um, I'm just about to release an album with a group I've put together, where it's my compositions. Um, it's I guess it's a bit of an extension of of my solo practice, where I've taken I guess what I've been improvising with and turning that into Compositions. Um, this is an ensemble with the Zella Magassian, wonderful Armenian uh, piano player, uh, Adam Yilmaz, the Turkish percussionist, uh, Nigel Day, the fairly recognised Australian jazz guitarist, and Linda Taylor, wonderful Australian jazz singer. Um, and we're we're actually recording on Sunday, which is um, should be fun. Um, but yeah, that's I guess that's where my my composition sort of sort of goes with that sort of thing. It's um it's very I guess double bass centric. Um, as this stuff tends to be. Elson, so great to chat with you for the podcast. Folks, check out the show notes of this episode for links to everything Elson's up to, his Chicken Chili Basil, awesomely titled album, and much more. And... Thanks for being on this journey with me, folks. Whether we're chatting with somebody from Sydney, Australia, or Brazil, like we did with Patricia Weitzel, or Trinidad and Tobago, like Caitlin Kaminga, or our upcoming guest, Carmen Rodriguez from Panama, it's so exciting to explore the world with this podcast and see what's going on with all these different bass players in all these different genres and all these different countries. I'm having a blast. If you got a suggestion for the show, whether be it a guest or a topic or whatever, email me, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. I'd love to hear from you. That's going to do it for today's episode, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs>